Hi, folks. This is Jim with the Song Tripping Channel. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, if uh, you've never been here before, I hope you will become a subscriber and click the notification bell. Always love to uh, get new listeners and viewers. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is this little cube, the Martha Argerich box set, the complete recordings on Deutsche Grammophon. First, a couple um, remarks about Martha Argerich. Um, I only discovered Martha Argerich's piano talent in middle age, I, better late than never, I guess. You see, I do love classical music, but I'm more of a dabbler. I'm by no means an expert at it. Um, but I do have a fair number of uh, pianists in my classical collection on CD and vinyl, and you're going to find familiar names like Glenn Gould and Alfred Brendel and Rudolf Serkin and Alfred Ciccolini and Vladimir Horowitz and Arthur Rubinstein, all wizards at the keys to be sure. But strangely, the name Martha Argerich wasn't there except for one CD of uh, Mozart piano concertos that I got, I think back in the 90s, uh, when I was a member of the BMG Classical Music Club for a while. But geez, how could this be? How could I only have one Martha Argerich album? And knowing what I know now about Martha Argerich, that's a scandal. So how could she not have been on my radar until just recently? It's, uh, it's a mystery to me. But anyway, the epiphany happened when I listened to this album uh, streaming and it's uh, where she performs uh, Robert Schumann's Kinderscenen, a work that I really do love. I first heard that on the radio in my college days and immediately fell in love with it. It kind of stuck with me. I even bought the Alfred Brindell version of it on vinyl and would listen to that from time to time. But this Martha Argerich rendition really shivered my timbers. What struck me about this, um, her playing was her ability to climb inside the music and evoke emotions without being over sentimental. And then she matches it with this fiery, virtuosic, seemingly effortless technique, like the, the, the she's a speed demon, but it's, um, you know, she, as a virtuoso, sometimes virtuosos take things too far and their style becomes too showy, too flashy. But Martha doesn't do that, in my opinion. Her talent serves the music, not the other way around. Anyway, after the Schumann CD, I, I, I went and bought it on CD. And then I researched her career more and discovered that she rose to fame in the early 1960s. And she became known as this really masterful performer of Chopin, especially. But um, lots of 19th century romantic music, that was kind of her specialty. This was the debut here, but um, she did people like um, Ravel, like even some 20th century stuff like Ravel and Prok um, Prokofiev, and, but especially Chopin, Liszt, Schumann, Brahms, uh, guys like that. And she even would do um, a little bit farther back in time, lots of Beethoven and Mozart, and even a little bit of Bach. But um, sometimes she would venture into the 20th century and do people like Bartok and Prokofiev and Stravinsky, and as I said, Ravel and Rachmaninoff. Um, so she um, strangely evades a lot of solo piano sonatas that you think um, a virtuoso would cover. So I'm thinking, especially here of Beethoven and Mozart, doesn't do them so much. In the 1970s and 1980s, she um, starts to veer away from solo piano performance and focus more on chamber music and concertos. And I watched a fair number of her performances on YouTube. There's plenty, just run a search on Martha Argerich and tons of stuff will come up. And I was really stricken by her mercurial yet playful approach to live performance. So she's very much in command, um, but she has, you can tell she's having fun doing it. Her playing is volcanic and furious or can be that way. And then she'll be tender and soothing. She's just fiercely intelligent. It's like she can channel and mind meld across time and space with these composers and, and really breathe life into their notes. 
Anyway, after all my deep diving, I couldn't resist getting this box set. And um, it's a 48 CD set spanning 1960 to, 19, 20, uh, to 2014. And uh, most of her recorded career has been on Deutsche Grammophone. So you're getting like pretty close to everything here. It comes in this compact cube with a booklet featuring credits and essays and line art and um, some photography. Let me see if I can find some photos for you. Example here, right? Um, and an index, uh, your standard uh, booklet. Um, it's uh, a nice package. Uh, first, I want to review the music, then I'll share a few minor quibbles I have with the presentation of it. The music is what really counts here, and it's amazing. I mean, her 1960 solo performances are really stunning features of Fire and Ice. Yikes, I mean, even composers I'm not so keen on become interesting to me. For instance, her interpretation of Liszt's Piano Concerto Number no. 2, and I think she does some other Liszt too. She makes him sound like a proto 20th century modernist. I really didn't understand that composer um, until I heard uh, Martha Argerich um, perform him. Chopin is obviously a composer that's dear to her and she keeps coming back to him throughout her career. Um, and Schumann is another favorite and her Ravel recordings are pretty stunning as well. I mean, there are no dark spots. It's all bright spots here. So I listened to the set in chronological order. You can see that their CDs are in there. And uh, what you do here are uh, how she begins to transition away from the solo work more into ensemble work. And there's a host of recordings on here with musical partners, Misha Miski on cello and Gidon Kremer on violin. Like there's just a ton of albums where she's working with those gentlemen. Later in the set, you get um, some wonderful live recordings like her uh, that she did at the Lugano Festival. And this, these really reveal a maturity of playing that has lost none of its shine. Uh, and she continues to perform uh, now that she's even into her 80s. The orchestral and the chamber music shows what a great team player she is. She's willing to take a back seat. She's not just always the front person. Um, and I, I really appreciate the variety of tone colors that you get in the box set. It's not just solo stuff, right? Um, that could be maybe a little bit too much of a good thing. There are some curious gaps in her repertoire worth noting. Like, uh, and I note the absence of them. I, I would love to hear how she approached Beethoven's piano sonatas and wonder why she hasn't chosen to record any. And I would love to hear how she would treat Eric Satie, um, who's a favorite French composer of mine. Um, I, She's so good with the 20th century stuff too. I, I kind of craved a little bit more of that. But these are just um, sort of minor uh, reservations. Um, the, the whole thing is great. Now, on to some minor quibbles about the set. As for sound quality, overall CDs sound good to excellent. Some of the 80s CDs sound a little thin and bright for my taste, probably due to the technology used at the time. But the problem I have is a little bit more about presentation, visual presentation. So if you look at, I don't know if this is gonna come through on the camera, I'll try to get a little closer. Like sometimes these mini LP sleeves, they just don't, the reproduction isn't so hot. Like it's only fair, sometimes good, but sometimes pretty bad. Like the, there's, it's kind of splotchy, botched, pixelated. I mean, Deutsche Gramophone really needs to take a cue from Sony, who does a much better job of presenting these mini LP sleeves. Quality control needs to be better overall. Also, if you scan uh, Amazon reviews of the Argerich box set, you'll find lots of complaints about the box design. Uh, I have to concur with them. So um, again, let me try to get a little bit closer here. All right, see the tape here along the top? 
the, what, with this box, uh, um, it's a cube and the CDs slide out like that, right? Well, if you put, if you go the wrong direction, like if you were trying to like put it back on this way for some reason, or you got things turned around a little bit, which is an easy mistake to make because the thing is a cube shape, uh, you're gonna bend and rip the, the box. So it's kind of flimsy that way. I don't mind the look of it. It's kind of striking that red and that line art, but this design leaves a lot to be desired. Despite those glitches, the box was worth the investment. I was lucky to catch it at a super affordable price on Amazon. I think prices have gone up since I bought it. And um, although I won't be buying too many more classical box sets, at least I don't plan to, um, mainly because there's so much great classical music you can stream through Tidal and Spotify and Apple Music. Uh, and because there's shelf space is limited here and I don't have limitless funds, um, even despite that, I'm really glad I got this box set. And I, I just wanted to celebrate Martha Argerich and what an amazing talent she is. Uh, Rick Beato does a very nice video uh, paying tribute to her. And I'll, I'll link to that in the show description so you can uh, watch his reactions to that and how amazed he is that she's still so talented well into her 80s. And when you hear music this great, you just have the believing in that there's still some good in the world that's worth clinging on to, that things are still worthwhile. And I think we all need to a little bit of that these days. So that's my review of Martha Argerich. Uh, if you've heard the box set and have some comments, we'd love to hear your opinions about it. And if you have questions, I'll try to answer them. Um, thanks again for watching Song Tripping. I hope you'll become a subscriber and click the notification bell so you won't miss new videos. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.